This morning in our series, Women Mean Business, we are introducing you to one of the superstars at NASA. Her name is Nagi Cox, and she is NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory Tactical Mission Lead on the Mars Perseverance rover and the Mars Curiosity rover. We're going to speak to her live in just a minute, but first, here's some of her story. When Nagi Cox was going through a difficult time during her childhood, she looked to the stars. From a young age, Cox aspired to work with robots in NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She just needed to find a path to get there. Inspired by Carl Sagan and his Cosmos television series, Cox was accepted into Cornell University, where Sagan was a professor, and she also received a scholarship from the Air Force. After graduating, she served in the Air Force, working as a systems engineer and an orbital analyst for U.S. Space Command operations. And then a dream finally realized. In 1993, Cox joined the crew for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She has since served as a systems engineer and is the deputy team chief of the engineer operations team for the Mars 2020 rover. She takes her role seriously, and for several days a week, Cox lives on Mars time so she can make the most of her work on the rover. It's all part of her dream at NASA, making air and space available for everyone. Nagi Cox is a woman who means business. Just, just her, right? Yeah. Nagi Cox joins us now. Nagi, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you and have you be a part of this series. We really appreciate it. Um, so I want to start sort of with just your dreams. I mean, I know that we know from you that at an early age, you knew you wanted to be part of the crew at NASA. You've also talked about how growing up in a Muslim household in Kansas helped you sort of realize dreams. Talk about how your upbringing helped shape you into the woman you are today and helped shape your dreams that you've now chased after. Good morning, Savannah. I'm really glad to be here this morning. And that's true that as I was growing up, I saw that given my culture, there, there seemed to be a difference between what was expected of boys and girls. And I thought, well, what's up with that? Why does it mm. matter? But I, I did see that we find we make up ways to, to divide ourselves. But at the same time, I could see that NASA and the space program was about bringing people together. So I knew when I was 14 that I wanted to be a part of that and work at NASA where we work for all of humanity and not just a, a particular group. Love that. So incredible to hear. I know you also served six years in the Air Force and you called the Air Force a boys environment. Also, let's talk about NASA. According to a survey done at NASA between 2017 and 2019, women only make up about a third of that workforce. Talk to us about forging your own path in these predominantly male environments. This is one of our favorite things to talk about during this segment. But for you, it's very real. Tell us how you did that. It was very different some decades ago when I was in the Air Force because there really were quite a few more men than there were women. And, you know, it took me a while as a young lieutenant to realize that it was about power. And I certainly had my fair share of stories of sexual harassment. And then I realized that this was something that was in my control. And, and I started to say, hey, that's not OK. Certainly at NASA, there are definitely more women. And even in the Air Force now, there are far more women than I was there. I was the only woman in my graduate class. But when I returned to my graduate school, the Air Force Institute of Technology, I saw, I saw more women in the lobby than when I was there. <laughs> so it has certainly changed. But it's also an environment in which even now what I learned was how important it was that women talk to each other, minorities of any kind, talk to each other, share their experience. And as soon as we know that we're not alone in what we're experiencing, we can support each other. And, and that's what I've seen happen over and over with the women I've worked with. Oh, so great to hear that that's happening where you are. And, and there's an important note about seeing more in the lobby. I mean, what a way to put it. Um, I also have to ask you about something that our viewers just heard about in the package we did right before this about you, which is how you're so committed with what you do with these Mars rovers that you'll even live on Mars time when you're here on Earth so that you can really take advantage of working with these rovers. Tell us just about that. I mean, we're so fascinated by space news here on this show, but what does that mean to, to live on Mars time? How difficult is it? And tell us about that work. Certainly, it's it's an important part of these missions, and we're on a modified Mars time now, but early in the mission, 
it's really something because the first three months after we land on Mars, and I've mm -hmm. done this four times now, we all are together. It was different in the pandemic, but we work together in person for the first three months, and we basically move a time zone every day in order to stay in sync with the Martian day, which is approximately 40 minutes longer than our day. And we do that so we make use of every Mars minute when a <laughs> rover is new. But that's hard on the team, so we only do it for three months. Moving a time zone every day is certainly hard on the team and our families, but it's fabulous because we're on Mars and we're working together. But after a while, it is time for us to try to get back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> so like anything else, it's a blast while we're doing it, but it is hard on our bodies. But it's worth it to work on Mars remotely. Absolutely. So cool. And what a fun fact that Mars Day is about 40 minutes longer than ours. Um, before I let you go, we do like to end with these guests for our Women Mean Business segment with you giving us a nugget of advice. Just one thing you could tell a young woman entering the workforce, maybe someone who looks up to you, what would it be? Something I learned from my mother because she did it for me so many years ago is when my father said, you know, that's not what girls do. My mom whispered, you can do anything you want to do. <laughs> and she was so supportive, but I also learned from that that it only takes one person to support another. So my advice for all the women and all the minorities out there, and in fact, all of us, is we can all reach out and find someone who will support and encourage us. And we can also be that person for someone else. I was so lucky that my mom, like so many immigrant mothers, mm. was so supportive and she set me on the path to my dream, which I've been so lucky to live. And I thank her every day. There's an important lesson there in having that female role model also. And you're so lucky it was so close to home. Nikki Cox, thank you so much. We so appreciate your time. You are a woman who means business, and we're happy to have you part of this segment. Thank you so very much, Savannah. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.